Hello, if you seriously believed in the potential of Bitcoin SV, what would you do? You might set up a fund to invest in BSV startups because you thought they had such great prospects. And if that wasn't enough, you might try to get into transaction processing with your own Bitcoin node infrastructure, whatever that is. Well, it's what my guest this week is doing, so I hope we'll find out from Dave Mullen Moore of Unbounded Capital and Unbounded Enterprise. So, hi, Dave. How's it going? You're listening to Coin Geek Conversations with Charles Miller. Let me ask you, first of all, just to, to introduce us to um, Unbounded Enterprise, because I spoke to your business partner, Jackson Lasky, about Unbounded Capital on a previous uh, occasion, and Jackson introduced uh, or announced the enterprise side of your business at the recent CoinGeek conference. So for, for people who missed that, just give us a, a quick uh, up sum of that, if you would. Yeah, so the announcement at CoinGeek was a great opportunity just to introduce to the space the Unbounded Capital team. It's kind of getting into the transaction processing and Bitcoin services area. So to date, we have had a team that's been investing in BSV companies and tools. Uh, and we actually started investing broadly in cryptocurrency and blockchain things. Um, when we kind of went down the, the big block rabbit hole and the Bitcoin SV rabbit hole, we realized that there was a lot more potential. Uh, really, the only potential in the blockchain space was in Bitcoin SV and decided to invest in tools there. Um, and really, I mean, th I think the way Jack says it, and it's very true of uh, the Unbound Enterprise ethos, is we saw this great potential. We were playing a role that we thought we could play well by investing and in capitalizing companies that needed capital to build. Uh, but there's so much opportunity that we thought, you know, we should really throw a hat in the ring here and we can help push the space forward. Uh, really the same goal as Unbounded Capital to drive the adoption of Bitcoin, um, but do it by building products that both uh, Bitcoin companies can use, and that would be transaction processing, and also packaging up products, packaging up Bitcoin tools to help get enterprises and companies currently outside the Bitcoin space able to use the technology and benefit from what it offers. The original part of the business, Unbounded Capital, was a, essentially a, a venture fund, but now you're rolling up your sleeves and actually running a business with the Unbounded Enterprise, it sounds like. Correct. Yeah, there's just too much opportunity. That's really what it comes down to is we were watching everything being built and we, we figured we can do more than just invest in companies. We can really, uh, and even some of the same companies that we're investing in, we can do more for those companies to help them get integrated into, into other companies uh, and just get their product out to, to really help show people what Bitcoin can do. None of you are, I believe, actual engineers. You, you come at this from the, the business side. Mm -hmm. How are you going to approach transaction processing, which seems about at the, as techy as it can get in, in this kind of area? The products that we're making will not be made by Jack and I. We will be overseeing and having input throughout the way, but we are not, um, we are not competent enough to build them ourselves. But luckily, the uh, presentation that Jack gave worked, and we had just a really tremendous set of inbound people getting in touch with us, wanting to work with us. It was one of the most encouraging things that I've seen in the Bitcoin space for a while. Um, after a year investing, I felt like, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of these people at conferences. I know what they're working on. I know what they're building. And I had this kind of naive sense that I knew everyone in Bitcoin. But we had just really, really high quality people reach out wanting to work with us, some of whom we've, we've brought on now. We're, we're growing the team. And it's encouraging to see the quality of people that are working on Bitcoin and interested in seeing it succeed. Right. And uh, at the conference, in fact, uh, Jackson announced that you were working with this uh, company called Zoken. Who are they and, and what do they bring to the party? Yeah, so Zoken Labs is a company uh, based in India. Nathan Mani is the founder, CEO, guru behind the scenes. And Jack actually met them just prior to when you guys spoke. He met them at Cambrian uh, in Portugal. So they actually are in a portfolio company of unbounded capital. So we've invested in Zoken. And now they're going to be kind of a centerpiece with their Zoken Vega node infrastructure for what Unbounded Enterprise is offering in terms of transaction processing uh, with the, the kind of 
the big headline of Zoken Viga is they're going to bring parallelization to Bitcoin and enable horizontal scaling. So if we think of to date, Bitcoin nodes have been operating on a really an alpha software where you can't scale the system up like we scale all other businesses by adding more computational power to it. If your node is a Raspberry Pi, maybe you upgrade to a node that's a laptop computer and then you have to upgrade to a node that's a desktop computer and you can scale up by improving the quality of your machine. Um, but by being able to just add computational power, that's what really unlocks the unbounded scalability of the system. So Zoken will be, we think, the first to market with that functionality. This is something that TerraNode is, uh, is going to accomplish as well. But we're really excited about, about being able to use Zoken at um, Unbounded Enterprise as well as invest in their development from Unbounded Capital. Right. And I, I quickly get out of my depth in this area, but being a node um, does not necessarily, in this case, involve being a miner. Is that correct? Yeah. So in the Bitcoin SV space, we've kind of started to differentiate between transaction processing and mining. Um, and if we think about mining to date has really just been buying hashing power and trying to solve the puzzle and unlock the new Bitcoins primarily, also some transaction fees. Um, and that was the way that you generated revenue was by mining these new Bitcoins. Um, we think that in the future, really the emphasis is going to shift to transaction processing. And it's going to be about how many transactions can you put onto the network uh, with massive volume, with tiny fees. And that's going to be the way to, to generate revenue. But can you do that without being in the competition to solve the software equation and be the, the miner, as it were, who, who adds the next block? Yeah, so the way that Undotted Enterprise is, is approaching this is we are actually building a mining pool. So we, we don't think that actually investing in hashing equipment and solving these puzzles is going to be the best place for us to focus our attention in the long run. So we want to outsource that if possible. So we're building a mining pool so that we will still be able to hash, but it won't be done on equipment that we own and operate. Rather, it'll be done in a market that, that we establish with this mining pool. So the transaction processor is what's going to enable us to take transactions from transaction generators, uh, put them on chain, and get them onto the blockchain. Uh, the mining will be done by, by other entities that we, we coordinate with, but not with hardware that we're, we're paying for and operating ourselves. If I've got an app that is generating a lot of transactions, I would come to you and say, please process these for me and you, I will pay you a certain amount to do that. Is that right? Yeah, so an initial customer base for us are transaction generators. So companies that need to put information on chain um, or otherwise interface with information that's being put on chain, um, we want to make it as simple as possible for them to do so and kind of remove some of the limits that even though we talk about Bitcoin is unbounded, um, there are still limits uh, that are in place. Like the, the chain transaction limit is one that you hear people talk about. Um, so we want to remove those limits and just whatever they need to do for their business purposes, we want to make it simple and cost effective for them to, to do so. Right. And so this plays into your um, enterprise side of things because you want new enterprises to be able to use Bitcoin as simply as possible. Yes. So that's the kind of the second type of customer I see. And this is you know something that is going to be less of an emphasis to start for us. But I think a major emphasis moving forward is how do we integrate these really profound uh, revolutionary tools into the existing business world? You know, we, I'm very optimistic about uh, Bitcoin startups. But I do think there needs to be a transition where we bring the, the old web model and kind of update it with Bitcoin. And currently, that's just really difficult. So I think there's a lot of really impressive tools that a really adventurous CTO could, you know, go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, get into what's going on, what we're developing, watch CoinGeek conferences, and then want to integrate these, these products into his business. But he's going to need to be especially, uh, especially brave to do so and have a really high technical competency. So if we're able to minimize, you know, take this collection of tools that exist, package them up into one comprehensive software suite 
and we're the single point of contact for that business, I think the odds that they'll integrate these tools are, are much higher. And what sort of business do you have in mind? Would it be a consumer facing business or something that is deep in the industrial infrastructure that the customer wouldn't be aware of? I mean, I think it'll be both. And this is really what I'm most excited about. Um, when I first got interested in, in Bitcoin and blockchain, I was, you know, I don't have a very technical background. My background's in economics. And we were talking before we press record and, and film also. So I was really excited about the consumer apps that could be developed on this. Uh, and very quickly in that process of learning and actually trying to build some, some consumer products, I became disillusioned and, oh, it doesn't scale, it doesn't work. Um, so Bitcoin is really reinvigorated for me. It does scale and actually does much more than I had thought initially. And there's going to be you know, a whole plethora of consumer apps that, that integrate this, these tools. And then also enterprise-facing apps or enterprise-facing use cases, once they integrate the technology, there's all sorts of consumer-facing apps that kind of interface with that. So I think about supply chain. You know, this sounds like a very enterprise, consumer-facing use case. But even today, innovations in supply chain and, and tracking, you know, when I, when I buy a product online, uh, sometimes I'll open my, my Shopify app and then just all of a sudden I see the tracking information and I didn't have to input anything. It just was automated. So this is, you know, solutions that improve the transparency of supply chain prior to Bitcoin have resulted a better user experience for me as a consumer, just finding out when my package will be delivered. I think it'll be similar with Bitcoin. There's going to be all sorts of enterprise use cases that at first will reduce costs and improve efficiency on the back end for these, these companies. But ultimately downstream, uh, because of the open nature, people can build tools that will, will really improve the experience for consumers also. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the limiting factor for consumers, it seems to me, has not been so much the technical one, but the onboarding process. It seems inevitable that you have to explain what Bitcoin is, what the blockchain is, and it's it's a whole new world for people. I mean, I think fundamentally it's just a new tool. I was actually thinking yesterday, now everybody has a camera on their phone, and this interfaces with all sorts of applications, right? So something like Snapchat or even just QR scanners, all these things benefit because of the camera being on the phone. Um, but imagine if you wanted to just pitch the idea of Snapchat, if you first had to explain how cameras work and get into you know, photography and light, like that is a, it's a crazy pitch and it's really just not essential for the user experience of you can take a picture, send it to your friends. I think it'll be similar where you know, if, if blockchain is the camera, right now we're very focused on explaining, well, this is what blockchain is, this is how it works. And then really essentially, this is why everyone else is confused about it. Uh, and that pitch takes up so much of the time, us describing how a camera works basically that we can't even really get to the exciting part of here's Snapchat, here's a QR code scanner. Um, and, you know, we've experienced that as investors. And I think it's one of our biggest features of Unbound Capital for entrepreneurs who are raising money for a BSV product is they can kind of skip that initial pitch because we start the conversation on the same page about what Bitcoin is and they can just pitch the product. And over time, I think that'll continue more people will be in unbounded capital shoes. More investors and consumers will know uh, the power of what blockchain can do, and they can just kind of cut to the chase and say, this is how it helps you. This is how it helps your business. This is why you should use it. I mean, one of the things that it is easy to understand for a user is you will own your own data. It's easy to understand the concept, but it's more difficult to really understand how that would work in practice, I think. And I mean, personally, I find it quite confusing in a way because I don't know exactly how this data would be shared with enterprises that I was interacting with. And, you know, it's sometimes complicated to remember how to get your online banking going. So having all sorts of uh, data that I sort of quote own is not necessarily an appealing prospect until I'm shown how that's going to work. Yeah, and in many ways, it almost sounds like a burden. Like, you own your data. and it's Yeah, like, I'd rather oh, somebody else to... is responsible for it, you know. Exactly. Now I have to worry about this. And, you know, I think in many ways, um, people will, like, 
if you said to me, you're going to own all of your online data, my first thought would be, well, like, that sounds like a security concern. I'd be worried about if I did the wrong thing. I think just the lack of security problems because of Bitcoin's inherent, um, just how it's designed, the lack of things happening will kind of make people not worried about things like that. But the complexity of it, I think, remains. And people are going to be worried about, well, this sounds too complex. Um, I think in reality, there's going to be a lot of a lot of services that come and we're just opening up entire new markets for businesses to provide value to consumers. So like one thing that I think about is if we're going to move away from this advertising monetization scheme, that doesn't mean that data doesn't have value. Data still has value. It's just not going to be owned uh, and kind of monopolized by these few companies. But I don't want to be out there selling my, you know, my geolocation data is pretty valuable. I think a lot of businesses want that, but I don't really want to be, haggling with a company over what what that's worth. But now, okay, well, here's this whole new market for a data broker, right? So you can kind of offload this onto somebody else. They're going to try to maximize the value of your data. They'll get a cut. You'll get a cut. Everyone wins. So I think a lot of services like that will, will spring up. And in many ways, that's what Unbound Enterprise wants to do for businesses. So maybe they're not worried about the complexity on the user experience, but they're worried about the complexity of implementation and how to manage all this, these new tools. Uh, if we can do that for them uh, in a way that gets them using the, the technology quicker, then, then we both win. Yeah, I can see that. And I wonder whether the conversation coming up will be, here's a business that can provide a very simple way for you to own your own data, because it is, as you say, looking after it for you. And mm -hmm. then the dilemma that follows from that really is, so therefore, how much power and responsibility does this new entity have? And is it different from the responsibilities placed on Facebook or Google for the data that they own of yours at the moment? The difference, I think, will be choice, choice and competition. So, you know, currently, if I go on Twitter, um, I can get my data uh, but even just the way that they, they frame that. So I go through the settings, it's kind of hidden and it's like, I'll download, you know, download the data and I have to request it. So that even just in that language, it shows, you know, this is their stuff that they're letting me have access to. Once it's mine and there's a competitive landscape of, you know, being a data broker or whatever services with that data, um, if I'm not happy with company A, I can move to company B. And I, you know, that type of power is really a big game changer. Yeah, I must say, I uh, just as an exercise, I looked on Facebook uh, not mm -hmm. so long ago because you can download all the stuff that they have of yours. And right. I, I was amazed to find uh, names and people's phone numbers and stuff that I didn't actually have, but were attributed to, to, to my contacts and therefore counted as data that I could download. So the idea that, you know, there is a lot of data that you have amassed with these companies is is very real actually i think and people don't always realize it and also the fact that it just exists in so many places is very confusing so facebook has your your friend's phone number um, but maybe your friend changes their phone number and that's reflected on this database but not that database getting all these things to communicate with each other is such a challenge right now and it's so much easier if they all just point to one place and this is the source of data. It's not owned by them. If I don't like how they're working with it, I'll move elsewhere. Uh, it's really, it just kind of changes the whole, the whole landscape. Yeah, I mean, just going back to your basic approach to, to BSV and its capabilities, we've talked about data a bit, but the USP in a way is the connection between data and money, even minute amounts of money. Your starting point here is from a financial side of the business with venture capital fund and a hedge fund and so on. Do you see a connection between the dollar value of BSV and the activity in the ecosystem? Because there's, it doesn't seem to me that there's necessarily a connection. I mean, obviously, if lots of stuff is going on, it looks like BSV is doing well perhaps the value will go up, but it's not a direct connection, is it? I think there's been a lot of talk and uh, we've contributed so much to this talk about, you know, Craig Wright's court cases and what this means and how the price of Bitcoin might change with some type of a black swan event. 
And these things are exciting for investors that hold BSV because they want their asset to appreciate in value. But really, the, the main thing that I'm excited about, if and when the price of BSV appreciates, is just more attention given to it from developers. So I want more people building. And when I say developers, I mean business developers, not protocol developers. I want developers making applications. You know, I want more things at CoinGeek conferences. I want each time there to be 10 new businesses that just are blowing people's minds. And I think currently a big reason that we're not seeing as much of that, even though we blow everyone out of the water in terms of our technical metrics, is because it's written off. Uh, and I think it'll be much harder to write it off when some of these metrics increase. One of those is price. I think uh, due to innovations in transaction processing, uh, like Zoken Vigo, we're going to have really an order of magnitude improvement in terms of, of our transaction throughput, and we can start to do some start to do some things that are, are really statistical outliers that might bring more eyeballs. But I think when the price is low and a quick Google of Bitcoin yields uh, scam and fraud and and all these negative things, it's hard to get developers and entrepreneurs building on it. Right. And so do you see what you're doing as a kind of um, almost Silicon Valley type business model? I noticed that your colleague Zach said that investing now in this in sector is like investing in internet startups in the mid to late 90s. Well, I don't know if I would say that we are using the Silicon Valley model. That would, <laughs> that would receive a lot of pushback. But I do think we're up against a, a type of innovation, a type of growth and in innovation that is akin to the dot-com boom. So I think that's more what Zach is talking about uh, with that soundbite is when you give people tools, they're going to build and they're going to find a way to generate value from those tools. Uh, we've had this amazing tool set since uh, you know, when I was born, which is the internet. And this is a, a huge upgrade to that tool set that now we can transact in tiny payments. We can have really, really highly interoperable data paradigms um, and we can have data ownership. I think entrepreneurs are gonna use these tools and the, the wave of innovation will be similar to what we saw in the 90s and early 2000s. How big is your business at the moment? And, and I, I see you're advertising, you're hiring people. What kind of people are you looking for? Yeah, so in the past couple of weeks, we've, we've hired our first three employees at Unbound Enterprise. And these are um, technical people. These are developers, cloud specialists, DevOps, people who understand how to build and grow a business, and people who understand the nitty gritty of Bitcoin, how to make tools that'll be useful for, for companies. So currently, we're at, we're at three, plus Jack and I, um, as the primary day-to-day -day employees at Unbound Enterprise. We're anticipating this is going to grow quite a bit. With the growth of the ecosystem, once we have many more potential customers, we're going to need to, to scale up pretty quickly. Um, so it won't be five for long, but currently it's five there. And then Unbounded Capital, we have uh, we have around 10 employees in total. So oh, okay. some overlap. So they really are separate uh, businesses. They're separate businesses, yeah. So they share a brand and they share a focus of driving the adoption of Bitcoin services. Uh, and also driving the adoption of unbounded capital portfolio companies. This is, you know, a really nice synergy between the two. Is at one business we want to drive, we at unbounded capital we want to drive Bitcoin adoption by capitalizing companies that need it, um, and we're going to invest in what we think are the, you know, the best companies. Um, and then we have unbounded enterprise, which is looking to take the best companies, the best tools, package them up, and sell that to people outside of the space, um, so we can invest in a company, and then also help them really drive sales through Unbound Enterprise. And it's kind of a nice, a nice one-two punch between the two entities. You mentioned the possible pushback uh, with the analogy of Silicon Valley, especially in relation to venture capital. Uh, I was uh, with Jackson at the Cambrian SV uh, right. boot camp in, in Lisbon, and there was a very lively debate about the role of venture capital in this sector. And a lot of people, I think I could say ideologically opposed to it. I don't quite know why, but are you up against that as a problem in that people don't really welcome venture capital with open arms necessarily in Bitcoin? 
It's really not a problem for us. I mean, if you don't want to raise money for your company, we're not holding a gun to your head right. and forcing you to take our money. Right. Um, so, and we don't want to invest in someone who, who doesn't want capital. Um, and some businesses don't need it, right? So I think, you know, he was talking in that, in that debate that you hosted with Aaron from Twitch. I mean, that's amazing that Twitch could build this product and generate revenue on day one, like you said. That's like a, a really, truly powerful facet of what Bitcoin offers. And, you know, I work for a fund, now I work for Unbound Enterprise, but, but really I'm in this space because I'm really excited about Bitcoin. So as a Bitcoin guy, I love that Twitch generated revenue on day one, and I don't want to stop them. And I think that removing friction of releasing a product and accepting payment, that's a great feature of Bitcoin. And we, at Unbound Enterprise, we want to help other people do that. So at Unbound Enterprise, there's no obligation that you're venture funded to work with us. Um, and we really want to help um, along the same path I think that Twitch is going of just removing friction to starting a business, making it as simple as possible to get up and running and generating revenue as quickly as possible. Uh, part of that's going to be removing complexity of, of backend and making it really simple to get as many transactions as possible or as many transactions, I guess, as you need on chain. At the other end of the, uh, the sort of funnel, how easy or difficult is it for you to raise money to put into your two businesses from people in the in the big wide world? Yeah, that's been a big challenge. So Unbounded Capital, we've been fundraising for quite a bit. It's an interesting discussion to have because we come loaded with all of these technical metrics and arguments for why Bitcoin is superior. And it's really not a hard case to make. Uh, when you're looking at, at the numbers, the big difficulty is just getting them away from what they're anchored to as what is the value of, uh, of Bitcoin and blockchain fundamentally. So Jack and I, earlier this year, uh, wrote a book. It wasn't initially meant to be a book, but it became a book about um, kind of outlining like what is this confusion rooted in really. Uh, and you know, we wanted to make a comprehensive case against that. So a lot of it is just kind of reframing people's focus away from this is something that enables you to operate outside the focus of law uh, and, and framing them towards this is a hyper-efficient network that offers fundamentally new tool set for businesses to have casual relationships online where you can pay cash for, for goods and services and tiny, tiny fractions and also data that doesn't need to be siloed uh, in individual businesses. Um, so reframing that, I think, is, is the big aha moment. And it's a big aha moment that I experienced, too. The first time I went to the, the Bitcoin SV meetup in San Francisco, which is run by Joshua Hensley and Ryan Charles, or it was at the time, um, I was kind of just taken aback when I got there. I thought I knew what I was going to walk into a discussion about this peer-to-peer uh, -peer money thing. And this, you know maybe had some ideas about digital gold. And I get in there and they're talking about how Bitcoin is a competitor to AWS. And I just like, it's just such a different frame of reference that I was just kind of taken aback. And I didn't do very much talking during that meetup. I did a lot of listening. Uh, and when I left it, I was like, okay, this is something that I need to understand to, to see what they're talking about. Uh, and that kind of kicked off a year of, of learning and diving into what this stuff is. Uh, so a lot of our focus at Unbounded Capital has been documenting that learning process and trying to make it easy to understand and then boiling it down into you know a bunch of blog posts, boiling it down into a book and really boiling it down into a, a pitch deck and a conversation with potential investors to try to get them in an hour up to speed about what can we do here and why is Bitcoin SV positioned to do it. Great. Yeah, well, I, I really enjoyed your book, actually. And uh, so I'll, I'll put a link to that in this because I, I thought it was brilliantly uh, expressed with, with really good little bits of evidence that were easy to understand and very, very persuasive. So uh, great. Thank you. Well done with that. Um, Dave, thank you very much for talking to me today. It's been really interesting. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. I hope uh, I wish you all the best with with both of your enterprises and hope we can catch up again before too long. Yeah, I'm excited to do it again soon uh, with more more details on Unbounded Enterprise. We, uh, we are staying somewhat high level right now because we're in production on a lot of these tools that we're building. Well, 
let me know let me know when you're ready to say some more and we'll we'll have another conversation that'd be brilliant thank you so much dave thanks thank bye for now thanks very much to dave mullin moore and as i said there's a link to the book that he and his partner jackson lasky wrote in the show notes it's called how bitcoin sv will win so we know where they're coming from next week something completely different as my colleague Natalie Mason finds out about UNICEF and its various blockchain projects, which should be very interesting. So please join Natalie next week. And until then, from me, Charles Miller, thanks for listening and goodbye.